Okay. Dear all, welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. Elias Argiris, the uh, coordinator for the STEAM speaker series. STEAM speaker series, uh, we have presentations. Uh, we invite uh, special guests, um, leaders in their uh, field, um, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics to be kind enough to uh, give us presentations and talks on their uh, topic of preference. Um, for this month, we have a very special guest. This is Kevin Nuth, Dr. Kevin Nuth. Uh, a very special guest with a very special project. You are used to specific types of uh, scientific projects and topics that we have uh, presented so far, but I assure you that this time it's very interesting, very uh, challenging, if you wish, intriguing. I'm very excited to talk uh, with Kevin about that. Kevin, allow me to call you Kevin. Uh, oh, certainly, and thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for your thank kind you. introduction. Uh, I can, you can call me Lyons, of course. A few words about Kevin. So um, Kevin received uh, his uh, PhD in physics, a major, minor in mathematics at the University of Minnesota. And then uh, he had, and then you had a very interesting uh, career development. You worked as research scientist, uh, Center for Advanced Brain Imaging. Then you moved to NASA, NASA Ames Research Center, where you spent four years. This is very interesting as computer scientist. Uh, you are editor in chief for the Entropy uh, Journal. You have lots of publications in the field. And in 2005, you joined uh, the uh, University of Albany, New York, and you're currently associate professor in physics. You have your own lab. Um, before I ask you about the topic, actually, I will ask you to uh, the topic of your presentation. Um, allow me to. Actually, I'm sorry, we can proceed. Uh, you can share um, the poster of your presentation if you wish. I can, I can show it. You can share it. Oh, well. yeah, if you can show it, that would be good. Oh, I don't have that quite ready yet. Give me, give me a second. Give me a second for our audience also to be patient. So the poster of today's presentation is shown here. So this is Dr. Kevin Noth. Um, the topic, today's topic is UAP. He will tell us all about UAPs, a scientific interpretation, maybe the only of its kind, the only of its kind. And of course, you get our audience get a hint of, possibly they get a hint of the topic of UAPs. Uh, we will talk about that and they'll get to understand exactly what is all about. So, uh, Kevin, I'm giving you the, <laughs> you can uh, proceed. First of all, um, my first question um, to share with us, recently, uh, the audience, our audience may not know that, but recently the government, the Pentagon, released a very serious report, unclassified report, um, acknowledging possibly for the first time in recent years, the existence of UAPs. So I will ask you to help us understand what is this all about? What are UAPs? What is this report of the government? If you want, I can share that with you. I can uh, share the uh, document. Do you want me to? Yeah, I can share the document as well. Sure. Um, yes. So let's see here. I need to first have the document and then share my screen. 
So this was from June. There we go, sharing the screen. All right. Right, so can you see the document yes. here? Absolutely. Right. Yes. So unidentified aerial phenomena is a new, a relatively new term that is basically replacing the older term UFO or, or unidentified flying object. Interesting. So Interesting. These, of course, these things have been reported um, pretty widely since the 1940s. And, um, and it really wasn't, it, it was a phenomenon that didn't really come into our collective consciousness until around 1947 or so. Mm -hmm. 1947 was a big year for UFOs. You had um, the report of the sightings by Kenneth Arnold near Mount Rainier in Washington, where he was flying his private plane and witnessed um, several saucer-shaped objects flying in formation near Mount Rainier. Mm -hmm. um, he reported that, and that was widely reported throughout the news. And um, and that and that's one big difference that happened that made 1947 different than previous events is that we had much broader news coverage. You had. Um, you had news by radio, television, newspaper, and and the news could travel and spread very rapidly this way. Yeah. So so that was presented in I think early June or, or late June or so of, of 1947, and um, and it was only about two weeks later that we have the Roswell crash, which mm -hmm. many people will have heard something of, perhaps at least a reference to where um, a what appeared to be a crashed craft was um, was found and recovered on a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico. The um, the Air Force investigated and they promptly released a press um, a statement to the press that basically says that they recovered a flying saucer. And then this was the next day retracted and um, and then they started with several different explanations over the last six decades or so, um, from weather balloons to various projects, various secret projects, and and um, and the fact that the Air Force's explanation has changed four times or so over the uh, last six or seven decades is quite suspicious. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so. So these were th those two events happened within you know a couple of weeks of each other, and then it was and then there was um, another um, new prominent UFO sighting near Puget Sound in um, Washington State, where um, a UFO was seen hovering over the water and was was dumping some kind of molten material was was being purged from the craft and well, some, of this, that report, yeah, some of this fell into a boat and so some of this material was recovered and then um and then taken to be studied and the people who were studying it and were flying back they had to um they were flying back because it was the I think it was the creation of the Air Force was happening that day and there was a ceremony they were flying to and their plane went down and the um, the Air Force officials who were studying this and the material all disappeared so that was not recovered. So that was a very suspicious event as well. And um, that again happened in July, 1947. So I think it was the confluence of these several prominent events that really brought this into the um, collective consciousness in the United States at least. And that's led to this mistaken impression by people that UFO phenomena basically started in 1947 and is some kind of American myth or mm -hmm. American urban legend, which really isn't true. Um, there are prominent UFO reports that go back well into the 1700s. Um, many of them, especially in the 1800s, were published in scientific journals. And so because they were they were unidentified atmospheric or astronomical phenomenon. 
And so there are numerous sightings that appeared in, in scientific journals. Um, one, one, one case, which is several of them are quite interesting, several of them, you know, even in the 1800s, discuss um, UFOs coming into the water, going into the ocean or coming out of the ocean, being observed by ships. So in one, one example in, in, in 18, 1898 in Newfoundland, near Cape Race, Newfoundland, you had a ship actually observed um, UFO coming, coming in and then going into the water. Or, but they've equivalently been seen underwater and which is the case they're usually referred to as unidentified submerged objects or USOs. Um, but then the submerged objects can actually leave and and go into the air. So, so the the focus has mainly been on the flying objects, not so much the submerged objects. Those and um, more recently, because of the taboo associated with UFOs, with it being labeled some kind of fringe topic or paranormal thing that you know only crazy people see or, you know, some <laughs> drunk guy who stumbles out of the bar at 2 a.m. looks and sees a light in the sky, right? And so, so it had basically achieved this stigma and um, the, um, the Navy especially has migrated to a new term, unidentified aerial phenomena. UAPs. UAP. So that's the new term. And um, when we're in, in meetings, with you know people you know engineers or or people from the navy were supposed to use the term UAP not UFO. Um, the 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 mean the importance of that was also to stress the fact that these are phenomena that it's not clear that these are objects. Um, although there's there is substantial evidence that some of these things are objects. So so I still I personally prefer the term UFO, but. Um, Okay. still read paper books books on paper instead of online so <laughs> it's I, I understand part of it is age right so so what's what's interesting and what's happened more recently so of course the government um has has had several programs that have studied ufos the most mm -hmm. prominent one was in the 1960s was project blue book run by the air force and that was closed in maybe 68 and um, and the the main purpose of many of these projects were to determine if these objects or these this phenomena posed some kind of national security threat. And the determination was usually that it doesn't pose a threat, and and there really was no reason for the Air Force to be studying this if it didn't pose a threat. And that's typically. Um, the attitude that that you would see um, may suggest that you switch from sharing the um, report to you. So uh, because I ah, sure I'm yes certainly so, that, uh, our audience sees only the report, not you. I want it uh, to right exactly. there. So, there we can see. so yeah. right. So more recently, what's interesting is that since. Um, since the early 2000s, around 2004, there have been multiple incidences with the U.S. Navy where these um, this phenomenon, UAPs, have have either interfered with the training exercises. Um, this happened in the 2004 Nimitz um, right. case. So the Nimitz carrier group was stationed off the coast of Southern California in, two, in November of 2004, and they were performing training exercises and UA, UAPs would be detected on radar. Um, basically, they would appear on, just suddenly appear on radar at about 80,000 feet, which is very, very high. 80,000 feet. 80,000 feet, yeah. Now, a, a passenger jet flies around 35,000 feet. Correct. You don't want to go much higher than that. So, so these things would appear on radar at eighty thousand feet, and they would then they were in this this case they were dropping to about twenty eight thousand feet, and then heading south. And you would have up to maybe ten of them at a time, and you know kind of randomly distributed, and they just track south 
from around Catalina Island, which is off the coast of uh, Laguna Beach, about halfway between Los Angeles and San Diego. And these things would head south to around Guadalupe Island, which belongs to Mexico, and um, then would just disappear off radar. So these things were monitored for about a period of two weeks, and it really wasn't an issue until they were preparing for a training exercise and some of the UAPs came into the training area. So you don't wanna have training exercises going on when you've got unidentified aircraft hanging around, right? And so, so uh, Senior Chief Kevin Day, who was the radar operator at the time, then um, got permission to um, order um, two of the pilots who were on this training um, training mission to go and check out one of these UAPs. So, actually, I'm sorry to interfere. There were two jets, uh, actually, uh, uh, two by two. Yeah, they were. Yeah, two jets. Two yeah, pilots. Two, you said, but yeah, two pilots. Well, there were. Yeah, there were four. four yeah, four two people. two pilots in each jet. Actually, four people. Yes. Two jets. Four witnesses. Four yeah. witnesses. Four witnesses, yeah. and they were they were vectored to the location of one of the nearby UAPs. And when they arrived, they saw they um they saw this disturbance on the water, and it looked like something was under the water actually, and the pilots observed this little white tic-tac-shaped object, mm -hmm. basically basically like a flying butane tank, right? A big, right. large Absolutely. butane tank. Very nice description, exactly. Yes. Yeah, and so, and, and this thing was zigzagging very randomly over the water. And um, Commander Fravor, one of the pilots, decided to check this out. So he dove down while the other pilot maintained high cover. And um, and as he he approached the the tic tac shaped object, it actually stopped its behavior and and started to rise to meet him. And he was circling the area, and then the tic tac was circling as well. So clearly, this thing was under some kind of intelligent control. It was mirroring his behavior, and um, and interacting with the pilot directly. So he then they made uh, a portion of a the turn and the pilot decided I'm going to try to approach this thing. So he was going to cut across the circle. And as he did so, um, he describes this tic-tac shaped object as, as accelerating as if shot from a gun. He said it went from, yeah. you know, that low speed to just, yeah. and, and it was gone, not visible in two seconds. And the, the other strange thing about this was that the training mission had a had a point that they were to meet up at called the cap point right. that only the people in the training mission knew about. This was this is classified information for the training mission and that was given to the pilots. And the cap point was about 60 miles away. 60 miles away. Right. And the UAP took off and literally went right to the cap point exactly. and just that, yeah. stopped and hung and stayed at the cap point. And so the from what's the probability in a 60 mile radius that the UAP is going to go to some random place and it happens to be the same place that the pilots were going to go to. It's very suspicious. And so it's not clear, you know, what the situation is there you know, either. Mm -hmm. So this was the event in 2004. So um, of course, there were there were more events. There were more events um, with the USS Roosevelt stationed off the coast of Virginia and and Florida right. in the Atlantic Ocean. They had um, numerous encounters there. And Very many, actually, I remember. Yeah, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of encounters. Yeah. And I wanted to mention that uh, if our audience has watched the 60 Minutes, uh, yeah. actually the Nimitz uh, story, the incident was well described in the 60 Minutes. Right, right. The pilots and all the details about the events. Right. So I, I'll, sh I'll share one of the videos here, if that if that's all right. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. We'll and let up. me see where the video is on. Here we go. That's the screen to share. All right. Share screen. And I want. This one, 
we'll go back to sharing that. And I think it's on, yeah, this here. So can you see the video right now? Actually, no, we see. Or are you still on that? The, okay, uh, the let me go back to. Uh, should I like close the report? Is it, did I no, open I, it? I, I got it now that we'll okay. show the right one. There we go. That should be it. Yes, we can see that. So this is the go fast video. Um, I apologize for the the language used by the pilots. No, don't worry. <laughs> So that thing cruising across the screen is the UAP, and they're trying to lock into on it. All right, so I'm going to pause it there. So this is the this is one of the UAPs that was filmed. Right. This is being filmed by an infrared camera that is temperature dependent. So the coloration on the screen depends on temperature. Right. And if you look down here where the bar is in the way right now, it mm -hmm. says there's the letters BLK, which means that black things right. will be warmer. Okay. So black things are warm, white things are cold. And what you see here in the background is the sea right. surface. These are waves in the ocean. The, this is the Atlantic Ocean. And the UAP here you can see is white. So obviously it's colder than the temperature of the water, right? Yes, and that's really important because you've heard probably if you've seen this on the internet and heard people talking about this, there have been a lot of claims that, oh, that's just a seagull. They're just filming a seagull, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's important to re remember this is an infrared image and a seagull is a warm-blooded animal. Oh. Um, that is not colder than the sea surface. And so the UAP is much colder than the sea surface. And, yeah. and in the data we've collected, we've actually found that to be the case as well. We've recorded temperatures down to 60 degrees below zero for some of these UAP. Mm -hmm. wow. And I'll, sh I'll show you an, a video of, of that later as well. So this is the basically the kinds of things that the Air Force was dealing with and um, <clears throat> And I really, so many questions. I, 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 I can there are, we all have so many questions at this so point. I think. Said, so, the data that you collected, uh, so data have been uh, became available to you by the uh, what did you, do you mean? No, we recorded this ourselves. Our UAPX team recorded this ourselves with some of our instruments. So, oh, we've gone out recording our own data at this point. Okay. We're actively trying to study these things, which, and so, yeah, I can, I'll, I'll get to that quickly. Uh, you can share with us whatever be. you want, uh, yes. Right, so, so things became really problematic for the Navy when the USS Roosevelt went to the Persian Gulf and they were engaged in operations in Syria. So their station in the Persian Gulf, you've got, you've got aircraft, leaving the aircraft carrier and flying up north to Syria to go on bombing runs and things like this. Right. And so they're actually in wartime operations and they were encountering, they were encountering UAPs on a regular basis. And, and this would happen daily. So, so now you've got UAPs that are basically interfering in wartime operations, which, right. which is a serious business. So, it is, so yeah. it's, it's clear that these, you know, there are, have also been claims, oh, this is probably the Air Force testing something on the Navy. And now, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's fine when you've got the Nimitz stationed off the coast in, of California and they're doing training exercises, but that's not what happened there either. Right. But it's a very different situation when you've got wartime operations. And as I had this described to me, you've got a pilot who's, who's flying north to Syria, getting ready to engage an enemy. And all of a sudden this object comes flying, flying at the airplane at several thousand miles an hour. 
Um, in some cases, they would fly between the two jets. If you had several jets flying, they would fly oh. between the jets. So within 50 feet of the other aircraft at several thousand miles an hour, this is incredibly dangerous. It's a, it's a safety hazard. Absolutely. And, um, and, in, and in another case, I heard a description where the UAP flew at the plane and then did barrel rolls around the cockpit and then took off again. And so now you have pilots who are frazzled before they're even entering the war zone. So it's a very dangerous situation for the pilots. Now it makes sense why this is why this is why the, the Navy has, has mm -hmm. and the Navy had to come out with this information because they had to be able to talk to Congress. Yeah. And where there was enough, there was so much taboo about this topic that they weren't actually able to go to the Secretary of Defense and say, we have a real problem here yeah. and and talk about it. So they had to release some of this information to make Congress aware that this was uh, the situation. And that's really a lot of what, you know, what this has all been about. And um, so now I can, uh, now I'll quickly go to the report. Actually, you can be very brief on that report. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll just point out one or two things. The The report is very, of course, the when when it was learned that there would be a UAP task force and they were going to form a report, there was a lot of excitement. You know, what are we going to learn? You know, what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah. And the report turned out to be very short. It's it's the the public version was only like nineteen pages long, yeah. and the yeah. and the version of the report that Congress saw was only about seventy four pages long. Mm -hmm. So it was a relatively short report that didn't have a lot of information that people had hoped to see. Now, and the conclusions um, are very vague, actually. I don't they're know, very I was vague. happy about the conclusions when I read it. <laughs> so there's a few, there's a few um, important points. The executive summary here highlights these things. Um, yes. This is this is an important one. There are probably multiple types of UAKP requiring different explanations. Mm -hmm. So not so number one, just so that everybody's clear about this, no one believes that all UAP are alien spacecraft. Correct. Some, Correct. some of these things do have prosaic explanations. Some of them may be phenomena, that, atmospheric phenomena that we've not studied yet or encountered. Mm -hmm. um, there are many possible explanations. And, and even if some of them are unknown craft, then mm -hmm. it's not clear that they're all the same type of craft. Correct. Um, so, so when people ask me, how are UAP propelled? Well, I don't know. They appear to use different techniques at different times in some cases, and some craft use different techniques than others. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like asking, how does a car work? Is it electric or is it gasoline powered? Right, and the answer right. be, no, it's diesel, <laughs> which is right, different than, right. right. So... <clears throat> Um, the most important thing here is UAP clearly pose a safety of flight issue and may pose a challenge to U.S. national security. So that's that's a concern. Yes. Um, and of course, they want to get consistent consolidation, consolidation reports from across federal government, um, the, fe the federal government. So mm -hmm. not all the aid intelligence agencies were cooperative in forming this report. And that yes. was also mysterious. Um, the the real assessment is that it's inconclusive as to what these things are. It's, they did make it clear that this is not American technology and, and it's clear that it is probably not foreign technology. So it's Meaning, not- uh, No so, US military, neither uh, Russian- It's not Russian, or it's or not Chinese, Chinese. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and when you when we get to talking about the capabilities and speeds that these things travel with, you will be very thankful that it's not the Russians or Chinese, and they will be yeah. very thankful that it's not American. So I think everybody will feel should feel some kind of relief at this point, um, although it's not clear who developed this technology. And so um, the for reasons I'll explain later, the, the language has shifted from saying that it's possibly extraterrestrial to mm -hmm. saying that it's possibly non-human. Okay. So just because extraterrestrial assumes that they come from another planet, um, non-human doesn't necessarily assume that. 
So correct, correct. Very interesting point. There is some potential. Yeah. There is some some thinking that they could be from Earth <laughs> as well, and yes. non-humans from Earth, yes. which is a whole yes. different interesting aspect of this. So, I mean, of course, the the a lot of the results are inconclusive, and the problem is limited data. Um, we just don't have limited data. This has not been carefully studied, and um, and that's one thing that I'm aiming to do is to carefully study these things. Right. Um, so speaking of so that's so that's a basic summary. Well, a lot. <laughs> it's it takes a lot. There's a lot to. There's a lot of yeah, background. Right. Background <laughs> is very important, and thank you for letting our audience know. Actually, I had very many specific questions, but you answer most of them. Uh, what are the uh, UAPs? How did you develop your interest to study, uh, to get in this business UAPs? But personally, you, what was the trigger? Yeah, well, that, no, that's a good question. Um, I had, I was, I'm, I'm of the right age where when I was a teenager, I was about 12 years old when Star Wars first came out. And so, of course, okay. I was very excited about science fiction. And around the time, that time, you had a TV show called In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy, who played, you know, Spock on the original right. Star Trek series. Yeah. And they very often, they talked about mysteries and things, right? And very often were, you know, covered UFO topics. So I grew up listening about UFOs and, yeah. and of course, thought... Yeah, this is interesting, and, and it would be interesting to know what's really going on here. And it really wasn't until, until I was in graduate school. I, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I moved to Montana State, the mm -hmm. state of Montana. Um, and I went to get my master's degree in physics from Montana State University in Bozeman. Mm -hmm. And it was probably um, our second week of classes. And so this was, would have been September of 1988. There was a cattle mutilation in Bozeman. I, I, I know, yes, yes. And I what know. happened was there were there were two cows that were killed and um, dissected in various ways. That was very strange. Yes. And we, the graduate, the new graduate students who had just moved to Montana were we were all kind of stunned by this. We had never heard of such a thing. How, who, who would mutilate a cow? Why would you do such a thing? And um, so we were actively discussing this in the hallway, probably very loudly. And one of the professors came out of his office to see what was going on. And mm -hmm. he came over to the discussion. And, um, and on the news, the main sources were, oh, they're probably aliens because there were UFO sightings that night. Um, and that's very common, apparently or they're Satanists performing satanic rituals. And so this was the two things on the news and we were discussing how ridiculous both of them were. And the physics professor who, and I'm not sure who I recall who it was because it was my second week there. I, I have an idea, but I'm not going to mention his name, but he came over and, and said, yes, well, this does happen here sometimes and they never figure out what's going on. It's, it's, remains a mystery and that's right. for and, and but it is very common that there are ufos seen around the same time wow. and then he said but what's really strange he said i have some friends who are in the air force and work up at malmstrom air force base in northern montana and there they have problems with ufos flying over the the ballistic missile sites and shutting down nuclear missiles right Right. And we listened politely, and, and I'll be honest, when he walked away back to his office, we laughed because, and we talked about it later, we thought, how, in the, world, nuclear how nuclear. in the world are UFOs flying over our nuclear missiles and shutting them down and no one's doing anything about it? That just is silly. And, yeah. and I really believed that until, um, Oh, it's around 2015. So this is 1988 to 2015. You're talking 30 years later. Right? I hadn't heard anything about nuclear missiles being shut down by UFOs for 30 years. And then 2015, I was preparing for to give an astrobiology lecture in my astronomy class. And some students had asked me about UFOs and aliens visiting Earth and whether that's possible. And I I was just poking around the internet trying to think of anything I could talk about that would be reasonable in class. Right. 
which is the internet's not the place to look, of course, but but I did stumble on something interesting, and it was the it was a press conference that was held at the National Press Club in I think 2010 um, by Robert Hastings, and mm -hmm. he held a press conference with six um, Air Force um, personnel who were recounting their um, encounters with UFOs at nuclear weapon sites. Wow. And three of them were from Malmstrom Air Force Base, the same Air Force Base. And they were talking about how UFOs were flying over and shutting down the missiles. Very small world. Very and small I was world. dumbstruck because I thought, you know, I thought, my God, I heard about this 30 years ago from, by, from a physics professor who knew the people who were involved. They were his friends. Yes. And I and I and and I thought that's probably ridiculous. But now that I'm hearing this in a broader context with other people and, and they have a press conference, I thought, what if this is really true? What if this is really going on and no one does anything is doing anything about it because they all think it's nonsense? Right, right. Right. And I thought, well, that's very serious. That we we might we could very well have a serious problem on our hands right. and nobody knows about it because no one wants to talk about it. And how common is that with serious problems, right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you. yes. So that that's that's what really got me interested. And I thought somebody has to really look at this carefully. I mean, this should really be thought about carefully. And and so I started digging in and reading about UFO encounters and realized that they go way back and and into the 1800s even and were published in scientific journals. And I thought, well. What went wrong? Where where did we go in in actually considering these as as objects of study to turning them into objects of ridicule? Where we have scientists on television, I won't name names, popular scientists on television who are ridiculing the idea um, yes. instead of being curious and studying them. Where where is our curiosity in all of that? So I so I thought, well, if I so I, I, I then had an opportunity to write an essay on UFOs for an online journal and I, and from a scientific perspective, so I, I wrote an essay basically outlining the fact that we ought to be studying these things and, yes. um, well, and that they're potentially interesting. And so I then, agree with you. And that's yes. what I did. And that's where I that's where I went. And, and so. at this point, I would like to invite you to open your uh, publication, which is again, the only one uh, if we can go through, uh, so you can explain the basic things. Certainly. Uh, your paper. And again, for our audience, I will emphasize that uh, when I looked into things, uh, it was the only one, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, peer review science publication uh, on the topic. That's, that's very, I, very I was, possible. There, there may be, I, a, I, I there may be a few others. Them. I think the trick is there probably have been a few hours there that have kind of sneaked in, right? And and mentioned the phenomena tangentially, right? While talking about another topic. But Possibly, this uh, is this is yeah. one of the first explicitly right. about UAPs, right? And it's right there in the title. So let me share my screen here. Thank you. So here is our paper. Exactly. Um, so I was, I'll be clear about one thing, um, as some of you may recall, or if you rewind the video, you'll find out that I am the editor in chief of Entropy. Oh. And, and there have been people who had said, oh, well, that's how it got published. He's the editor in chief. So <laughs> you said yes. And, and, and um, if you're an editor in chief of a journal, you know that it doesn't quite work that way. The, oh. um, this was presented at a conference at the Maximum Entropy uh, and Bayesian Methods Conference in 2019 at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics wow. in, in Garching, Germany. So we presented, yeah. we presented this as a talk, and we and we of course wrote a paper for the proceedings, and then the the that the organizers for that conference um, had partnered with our journal Entropy mm -hmm. to publish a special issue highlighting. Um, interesting papers from the from the talk. So so we submitted our paper 
you know, for that. And the conference organizers had it reviewed and they and they decided to include it. So very nice. Very nice. Right. So so the idea was to here, yes, there is a lack of data. That was is one of the big problems. So I thought we're going to just publish a paper on on where most of it is basically looking at anecdotal data. Um, just to get some idea of how fast these things actually move right. and how fast they accelerate. And, um, and we took on the challenge of trying to estimate the speeds from the um, Navy's Nimitz video. Right. So that's basically what the purpose of this paper was to get, just do our homework and get some idea well, of what we're dealing with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the idea of the paper, um, of course, I'm not going to read the paper to you. That would not be fun for anybody. Um, um, yeah, let's I don't see here. Let me go to a, a plot or two. So there's a few different cases that I talk about in the paper. One of the first ones is an encounter with in February of 1951 with Lieutenant Graham Bethune of the U.S. Navy. Um, they they basically were they had been. They had been directed to Keflavik, Iceland to deal with a UFO that was basically hanging around Keflavik. And so the Iceland, the Icelandic government was requesting assistance from the US Navy to come check this thing out. And okay. so they, they went there, they weren't able to find anything and they were on their way back um, to Nova Scotia and um, <clears throat> and while they were flying at 10,000 feet um, over over the oceans, they saw off in the distance, they would saw a ring of lights that looked kind of like a city or maybe they thought maybe there's ships on the water. Um, they were able to confirm that there were no ships in the area and they were worried that they had gone off course and didn't know it. Um, and as they approached the object, they were about, um, as they approach the object, the the or as they approach the lights, the lights um, basically came out of the ocean and flew up to their altitude right in front of the plane. Right. Um, basically, rose up. Mm -hmm. It was about two hundred feet in front of the airplane. Yeah. The um, the craft. They they said it was a large disc that was metallic, about two hundred to three hundred feet across. So this thing is about the size of a football field. Sure, yes. A flying football field, a flying metallic football field. You tell me how you do that. I don't, because I don't have any idea. I'm a physicist. I wouldn't know how to fly a football field. So, and, and of course the, and the light, the edge of the disc is glowing. It's a glowing, glowing yellow color, but it would change color as it would move. So they attribute it to like a plasma. It looked like there was a plasma around the, the object. And, and, it, and it hung around their plane for, for a few minutes. It was seen by most of the people on the plane. Um, and and then, then it took off and they estimated the speed at which it left to be about 1500 miles an hour. And that was actually picked up on radar by one of the radar stations in Nova Scotia and they confirmed that it was around 1500 miles an hour. So one of the important points is this is 1951, aircraft yeah. flying at 1500 miles an hour is unheard of. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was confirmed by Gander, Gander Center radar to be moving at 1800 miles an hour. Yes, so sir. the air, the airspeed record in 1952 was 698.5 miles an hour. That's the airspeed record. So the fastest any plane had ever gone in the almost two years later yeah. was only 700 miles an hour. This thing was going about three times faster three than times the world faster. airspeed record. At that time, this is astonishing, yes. And it was confirmed by okay. radar, right? So, so what we did is we basically wanted to get some idea of how fast the object accelerated from the sea surface to their altitude at 10,000 feet. Right. And we, we used error, we put on some uncertainties, about 10% uncertainty in this, which is kind of the uncertainty that you know, physics students have in the lab, right? <laughs> and, sure. and so um, 
So we statistically worked this out and found that the minimum acceleration, which would be assuming that the object would accelerate as it leaves the surface to a top speed at halfway and then decelerate at the same rate uh -huh. to get to the altitude of 10,000 feet. That minimum acceleration was 1,700 Gs or 1,700 times the acceleration of gravity. Wow. <laughs> Which is which is insane. Now um, humans can handle humans can handle up to about ten Gs, exactly. Um, exactly. much more than that, and you're risking really hurting yourself. Our aircraft can only handle up to about thirteen Gs before their wings rip off. Our fighter jets can't do mm -hmm. more than thirteen, and this was seventeen hundred times the acceleration of gravity. Um, and to imagine what would happen to a person in there. If if you also I'll be kind to myself. Let's let's say I my upper half weighs about a hundred pounds. Nice round numbers, right? Now that's at one g. Now if I accelerate at two g in an elevator, it's going to feel like two hundred pounds. Two times a hundred. Okay. okay. So now if I accelerate at seventeen hundred g, this hundred pounds is basically going to be. Um, in, well, if I accelerate at a thousand g, right, this hundred pounds is going to turn into a hundred thousand pounds, right? Right, right, right. So at seventeen hundred g, I'm looking at the upper half of my body effectively weighing about one hundred seventy thousand pounds. Now you ask, you tell me what happens to the lower half of your body in that case? Yes, it's a puddle of jello on the floor, right? That's what yes. happens to all of you. There's no way that anybody's going to survive that. So it's not clear. So not only are people not going to survive that, but but equipment will survive be. that. Yes. Mm. Yeah, we can't even make machines that are going to survive that. So it's not clear what, what's going on here. These things are people have quoted these speeds as being impossible. And um, yes. and the whole purpose of this paper is to find out how impossible are these you know, speeds and acceleration. Some numbers in perspective. Correct? Let's get some. Let's get some ballpark <laughs> numbers, right? We don't expect them to be perfect, but they're. We're no, not off by an, We're not off by a factor of ten. You know, yeah. we know that. Yeah. So, so this was the basic idea. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. This the another case we looked at was no, the Japanese no. airline flight that happened in 1986. This. Um, this was a um, this was a 747 that was that was carrying cargo across cargo, correct correct I remember yeah, across um, across Alaska they were basically carrying Bujolet Nouveau from Paris to Tokyo. Okay, correct. And of course, peep skeptics then laugh. Aha! The pilots must have been <laughs> having some of that Bujolet Nouveau, right? Well, no. so um, that's not what happened. So the so they encountered um, several large UFOs. One of them they estimated to be four times the size of the 747. So yes. this thing basically the size of an aircraft carrier, yes. and it was walnut shaped and followed them for forty minutes. So this yes. wasn't like a two minute sighting or oh whoa, wow what was that? It was forty minutes. This thing was moving around the plane for forty minutes. And there were times when it was in front of the cockpit and the pilot said, I couldn't see anything out the window because exactly. all I could see was the craft. And so there's no way that a pilot is going to be mistaken to that degree, right? How, I, I like to think, how wrong could the pilots be? <laughs> how wrong could somebody be? When somebody says it was so big, I couldn't see out the front window, well, it's big. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. You're not left with many options. Yes. So this was actually picked up on military radar. Um, it was not detected on the civilian radar. There's reasons for that, actually. Mm -hmm. The civilian radar only displays things that look like airplanes because yes. the civilian radar is trying to give the radar the the air traffic controller a nice clean screen. So it's trying to get rid of all the noise. So anything that's moving faster than an airplane or bigger than an airplane, it figures the, the software says it must be noise. So it just takes it off, doesn't display it. Okay. Okay. So that's, so people ask, well, why don't these things show up on radar? Well, that, that's actually why. 
but it did show up on military radar and, and those records were preserved. So um, we were able to know some information about this. The thing basically kept a distance of about seven and a half miles from the airplane and it would move from position like one o'clock to six o'clock in one sweep of the radar, which was about 12 seconds. So in 12 seconds, it would go 15 miles from in front of the plane to behind the plane, right? <laughs> and, then, and then stop, right? So now you can put limits on what the acceleration is. And there's a schematic two size, right? So that's how big the 747 would be compared to this thing. Um, and either we modeled it as either it goes linearly over or under the airplane or it goes around the airplane. You get different accelerations in those two cases. And I see so, you calculated the G. So the accelerations are on the order of anywhere between 68 times the acceleration of gravity to about 84 80. times the acceleration of gravity, something in that ballpark, right? Which again is excessive. It's still crazy. No, no. So, so, I mean, what you, the takeaway from this is somebody knows how to levitate an aircraft carrier and accelerate it at about 70 times the acceleration of gravity. Yeah. Exactly. which is really phenomenal. Yes. As a physicist, I want to know how to do that. I would like to do that. And I'd like to know how. Um, I, don't, I don't know where the curiosity of my fellow physicists are. I don't, <laughs> most of them haven't. And these calculations aren't that hard to do. They're pretty much elementary, you know, first year physics equations. Um, there was actually, I was really pleased. There was a high school in Georgia, of all places, where they were, had the teacher, the physics teacher had the students working through this paper, actually doing the calculations themselves just to, to learn how to use physics to answer the questions. And I, I was very pleased by that. That was nice. So the, the, the last one I'll talk about briefly is the Nimitz encounter. This is the, uh, some of the modeling we used here. Uh, let me go down to the pictures. Those are more fun. Okay. But this is part of the video. The last, the last 32 frames of the video, the plane is moving forward, not turning, not doing anything. It's just approaching the UAP. The UAP appears to be relatively stationary and then all of a sudden takes off to the left at a high rate of speed. Now yeah. the, um, and it moves so fast that the, computer loses track so the computer can't track this thing now these computers are designed to track track missiles and and missiles can accelerate at 32 g's um mm -hmm. and still function so so this thing must have been accelerating faster than that for the computer system to lose track <clears throat> So basically what we did is we identified the right edge of the UAP and tracked its position over time, tracked its pixel position over time, and then, um, which is here. So the, the pluses are basically the position on the screen over time. Okay. There's, a jump, there's a jump that occurs because the targeting computer changes the magnification of the screen and part okay. way through. Mm -hmm. So we modeled that as well. So we're using um, techniques from Bayesian data analysis to model this. And um, the, <clears throat> the best model we found was model four, this one where okay. the object accelerates. And then, and then um, after, after this, then basically coasts at some speed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not quite coasting, it's, it's decelerating a little and accelerating right. a little. It's changing its speed a little bit, mm -hmm. but but that's basically what it's doing. So it gives you some idea of what that acceleration is at least. Yes. And we found that acceleration to be about 75 or 75 mm -hmm. Gs. Astonishing again. Accelerates yes. away and to the left actually. Right. So we were able to get, and so the one of the tricks here is anybody who's done this type of analysis will tell you, you need to know to get the acceleration, you need to know the size of the object. Correct. And we didn't know the size of the object. We only had the, the reports from the pilots and all of the pilots said that it was about 40 feet in length mm -hmm. around the size of an F-18. Cool. 
So, so we, use, we use that number. Mm -hmm. So so critics would say, well, you didn't know that it was that number and, and say that's true. So let's look at a, another scenario. So the 75G comes from assuming that it was 40 feet long. Okay. If we assume that it's four feet long, really well, close, mm -hmm. then the thing would have accelerated at seven Gs. Mm -hmm. It still would be weird because how do you take a four foot long drone if that's what it would be? Yeah. It would, first, it would be weird for the pilots to mistake something that's four feet long for something that's 40 feet mm -hmm. long. That's a pretty big mistake. I don't expect a pilot to do that. These pilots are trained to be able to identify aircraft and sizes mm -hmm. of things. <clears throat> and if they weren't able to determine it, they would tell you they wouldn't have known. So um mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it were four feet long, it still would have been seven Gs. Still interesting, especially yeah. since the video doesn't show any type of propulsion. There's no rocket engine here. There's no exhaust coming from the craft. The infrared images would have showed you that. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, so those are that's basically this this here. Now um, I can show you a bit of what we've done, and maybe that will be a good way to bring some of this to a close, I think. Sure. Um, let's see here. This is a, can you see my, my PowerPoint yes. screen? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. This is something yeah. new. So, so again, I'll show this. We'll go back to the whole thing that, of course, the vast majority of UAP are misidentifications. We know this. And a large proportion are hoaxes. That's all true. And nobody is denying that, but there are about 3% of these things that are interesting. Um, here's a case of mistaken identity. This person was taking photographs of the ship or something, and mm -hmm. then later saw that this UAP flew. Well, he says it's a UAP flew in the way. Um, mm -hmm. I happen to figure out what this is because- oh, This is interesting. <laughs> I, I cannot tell, I, I cannot tell. It's hard to tell. Okay. And and it's important to know that it's hard to tell. Um, okay. I'm a bird watcher. My my okay. I've been bird watching with my father since I was five. Makes so sense. I realized right away it was a seagull. <laughs> it makes and sense. when you compare it, you can see it. But yes. this this is common. Um, a lot of the really fast ones that people film and put on YouTube, most of those are dragonflies and bees flying okay. really close to the lens and they're out of focus. Um, some of these things are fake or hoaxes. I think I don't think this one was meant to be a hoax. It was meant to be a, a mock-up or description of what they saw. But um, you can see that yeah. the stars aren't real. You don't see stars. The yeah. first, these aren't real stars. There are no constellation patterns yeah. here. So the stars are fake. And so you can tell the image is fake, right? Yeah. Yes. So, all right, but let me get on to the more interesting thing, which is what we know. So I've been working with um, UAPX which was founded by um, senior chief Kevin Day. He was the operator on the, um, on the Nimitz aircraft okay. carrier when okay. they record, when they redirected Fravor and recorded that video. So, yes. so that's Kevin Day there. And so we've been working to collect um, imagery from UFOs and I can't go into a lot of details yet because we are still analyzing data, Sorry. Sorry. but I will show you this one, which I've presented elsewhere. This is actually, let me pause it here. Pause, yeah. please, thank you. Now this, what you first see is you'll see an airplane. Yeah. That's a jet air, that's a passenger jet. Mm -hmm. And the sc color scale here is that the whiter objects are warm. Whoa, yes. So this, this is a passenger jet. We know that it's coming in to land at Seattle. This was filmed in Washington state. And it's at about 3,000 feet when this video was taken. So that's what an airplane looks like. Let me see if I can back this up or restart it by going here and then there. All right. So you'll see the passenger jet. And then in a moment, you'll see it's being followed by something else, which is going to come in there. Yes. That is not a passenger jet. Um, it was picked up on two cameras. This is the second yeah. camera. So we know it's not an artifact was recorded on two separate cameras and that we don't know what it is and right. it was this is a close-up of it it looks like a trefoil shape yes i yes. like to joke that it looks like a klingon yeah. battle cruiser but 
hopefully it isn't anything like that. But I, I would comment on the speed of that thing seems to be similar to the speed of the first one. It appears to be shadowing the plane. <clears throat> yes, that's that's an that's mm -hmm. a. I recently learned that that's a term that's used that UAPs uh -huh. often shadow airplanes. They'll follow the airplane and what they're doing following it. Nobody knows, but that's common. Yes. How'd you like to know that you were on that flight to Seattle and you were being followed by, if that thing's at the <laughs> same altitude, it's just as large as a 747, right? Yes. <laughs> or a 737, yes. right? So it's big. Absolutely. Yes. Um, yes. You'd think people would want to know about these things and pilots encounter them and pilots typically don't talk about it because of the taboo they'll be Correct. treated as nuts and they're afraid of losing their license or being fired the the pilot from the japanese airliner that was followed by the ufo for 40 minutes was fired actually really and really? it took him years later to get yeah. reinstated yeah so there are serious consequences for pilots reporting these things but mm. that really has to change if we're going to collect real data and um, that has changed in the UK. The UK, they're now required to report these things. Right, right, right. Very interesting, very interesting. And, and the last thing I'll point out is that it, its temperature is much lower than the jet airplane. This yeah, one is about, yeah. this is about 60 degrees below zero. It's running cold. Our machines run hot, thermodynamics, right? <laughs> <laughs> Our machines right. are hot. Right. These things are cold, they're different. It's not clear what's going on here. Yes, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. So you surprised us today with uh, stuff that uh, material that we have not seen before. Right. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, so uh, these things are these things are really interesting. It's not clear. It really does appear that some of these objects are very probably craft designed by someone who's not human yes and which is the are they they're alien extraterrestrial non-humans living here on earth um it's not clear what the situation is come from other dimensions you know i don't necessarily subscribe to the other dimension theory but but I will let our audience make their own conclusions on this. Or, at this no, point, that's all we can do. Right, yeah. right now, right now is the situation is that all the hypotheses are on the table until we can start yes. ruling them out. Yes. You know, the trick is in science, you have to rule out hypotheses right. with data. And so now the idea is to start ruling things out. And it's difficult to do because it's not clear whether so we collect data from one of these objects, like the film I just showed you. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that that information is generalizable to other objects. Correct. For the same reason that uh, data on an electric car isn't going to tell you much about a gasoline-powered car, right? right. So right. it's not clear that these are similar or the same, and it's yes. not clear they were made by the same peoples. Yes. <laughs> there could be multiple individuals or groups involved and it's not clear who they are but we will agree that uh, there is a necessity absolute necessity that more scientists need to look into things and yeah. develop methods accurate met methods better methods in order to study this right. phenomena more yeah. scientists yeah so um, i'm working with uapx i'm also involved with the scientific coalition for uap studies right. scu and um, I recently also joined the Galileo project with Alfie Loeb. So. Right, right. Another very yeah. interesting scientist that hopefully we might have the opportunity to talk to him in the future. Right. Uh, Kevin, uh, the time may not allow to continue. I would love. Yeah, I think I think we're Thank good. You. We don't want to saturate our audience. <laughs> yes. Uh, very exciting. Very exciting. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank um, I would you for love having to me. follow up with you in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that you have more exciting things to share with us. And I will thank our audience. Um, we'll see them. They'll see us next time. Thank you again. Thanks for joining us. No, thank you so much for having me. And I hope that I hope that everyone has gotten a taste of how interesting this is and maybe piqued your curiosity to some degree because i think we need more curiosity more curiosity back in science i think 
yes. is this is exciting, potentially exciting. I mean, we absolutely we have potentially have numerous discoveries here, yes. both going from how these things work to who these peoples are and you know where they come from and there's a lot of things learn. And, uh, many implications <laughs> and there are many implications social many, political yeah. all over absolutely. the world yeah absolutely kevin i will uh, stop recording all right very good thank you very much for having me thank you